This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Jessica Morrison. Smart devices such as phones and laptops have become entwined in so many facets of our lives. From staying social to banking, shopping and booking all sorts of appointments, you'd be hard pressed to find a task that couldn't be done online. Throw in a global pandemic where populations were, and some still are, being encouraged to stay home, meant our reliance on digital devices grew exponentially as our entire lives were moved online. Going beyond phones and computers, it's estimated that over 30 billion devices are now connected to the internet, most with limited privacy and security protection. With that sheer number and a lack of protection, experts warn of the increasing threat of cybersecurity attacks for individuals and organisations. So what does this mean for our future use of these devices and how cybersecurity will look in the years to come? To discuss this topic, I spoke with Stefan Prandtl, an associate lecturer at Curtin University's School of Electronic Engineering, Computing and Mathematical Sciences, and his colleague Tim Jones, the CEO at Hyperfire, a cybersecurity startup. Thanks for coming in and chatting with me, Stefan and Tim. Um, why does an everyday individual like myself need to protect my computer and devices from cyber attacks? There's a couple of reasons. I mean, the first one is, is you don't really want someone going through your personal information. You know, you've got a lot of stuff that is kind of important. You know, there's obviously your healthcare stuff, your banking stuff, very specifically, very, you know, sort of immediately what's in your bank. Um, but there's also the fact that, uh, you know, one of the big things that we're seeing at the moment is uh, criminals and, you know, very advanced criminal organizations realizing that you actually work for someone and that you generally have access to stuff that that business needs you to use to do your job. So you're going to be hit by people because they go, hey, I can use your access into, I don't know, Curtin, for example, to get into Curtin and then start doing something malicious. And then of course you get the blame when the security team comes after you. And of course, generally speaking, you at home won't have as you know strong security as say your organization does. You're not gonna be, you know, always going to be the sort of person that's going to have like multi-factor authentication on everything. We've got to click on your phone and stuff. Um, but you are going to, you know, need, you know, so you're going to be something that's vulnerable to being, I guess, attacked at that point. And then they can use the fact that they've now owned your phone and owned your laptop and whatever to then, you know, sort of change position and sort of pivot into your company. And it's much easier for them to do that because now, you know, it looks like you're a trusted person doing stuff you're supposed to do, except now it's some guy in Russia instead of, uh, you know, you yourself, uh, which is a bit of a problem. Sounds a little concerning. <laughs> <laughs> Look, many of us have encountered a, a phishing or a scam email, but what are some of the other more common types of cybersecurity attacks we need to be on the lookout for? I guess I'll take this one as well because this one's a this one's a really simple one. Um, one of the problems that you have with cybersecurity is people think, or at least you know, a lot of people sort of have this idea that it's a computer problem, right? And that uh, you know, this this sort of goes into business as well, where you know people assume it's a technology problem once you've got the technology you're fixed. So you know, a lot of the problems that you have in cybersecurity are actually emblematic of what it actually is, which is a people problem. You know, uh, you don't use the same key for all of your doors for a reason. You know, you need to use different keys because if someone steals your key, you're in a lot of trouble. So I guess some of the big ones that you'll see, I mean, apart from phishing emails and, you know, really clever phishing emails, you'll also see that through other ways that you can get contacted on the internet. So I'm not sure if you've ever seen one. I've been getting them quite recently. Uh, you'll get text messages on your phone uh, that are phishing. They'll be like, hey, my favorite one is, uh, this is DHL. You have a delivery that we're delivering right now. Please click this link. And of course you look at it and you go, I'm not expecting a delivery from DHL. And you click on it. And that's the attack. That's how they get you. Because once you click on that, it's all over. Um, <laughs> <That's just> scary. <laughs> but you'll see that a lot. Uh, you'll get messages over Facebook. You'll get people trying to friend you on Facebook that are dodgy. Uh, you'll, you'll get all those sorts of people to people things all based around trust because that's where the problem really is. Uh, the more advanced stuff, the more scary stuff where you're getting attacks where you go to a website and suddenly your browser's taken over. Those are rarer and rarer these days because the companies that are protecting those are getting smarter and smarter about getting behind them and you know stopping that from happening and getting on top of it before it becomes a real issue. The ones that they really go for these days, yeah, are really simply the ones where they can get you, the person, rather than the technology itself. There you go. Something to be mindful about that it, you might have the latest antiviral <laughs> virus software, but if you are too trusting, then maybe that's where things really fall down, right? 
Um, over the last year, reports have shown that there's been about a 60% increase in ransomware attacks in Australia with large companies targeted such as Nine Entertainment and JBS, the world's largest meat supplier. What are ransomware attacks and why are they on the rise? Yeah, so ransomware attacks are basically where um, criminals, cyber criminals, will, I suppose, breach your network, breach uh, you know your computer network, typically in a workplace. They will sit on the network uh, quietly, do a reconnaissance, try and find out where the jewels are, where the, where the gold is, where the valuable information is, learn the best way to get hold of those things. So for example, it might be a database, might be a finance database or your customer database, or it might be um, you know, something else of value. Then they'll work out the best way uh, to encrypt those databases. And then when they're, when they're good and ready, they'll encrypt the databases so that you can't access them and then they'll hit you with a ransom. So we will decrypt this if you pay us, you know, pick a figure, a million dollars. And, you know, it's a pretty well-known fact that a lot of these cyber criminals are very sophisticated. If they've chosen your organisation as a target, they will get in, it's just a matter of time. So it's pretty scary. Gosh, it is scary. Um, what do you do if you're a big corporation and this has happened? Do you pay the ransom or oh. what's the general industry standard? Uh, so the industry standard is hotly debated, believe it or not. Um, so for a bit, there was a little period of time where everyone was like, oh, the simplest solution is just pay the ransom. And the reason was is that this isn't done by, you know, your average random criminal. This has become very rapidly over like over the last 10, 15 years, uh, has become this vast highly specialized industry, like an entire dark economy. There's like, there's not just some guy that hacks into your thing and steals your stuff. There's an entire group of people uh, who have been, you know, uh, they're just, all they do is they break into stuff. They just find ways in. That's, that's how they get their money. Cause they find a way in, they then take that way in and they sell it off to the next group of guys. And so you've got this next group of guys who basically go in and figure out how, you know, valuable that is. And they'll go around and poke around and see what's in there. And they'll go, cool, this is what I'll need to encrypt. And then they launch the attack and encrypt that stuff. And then now you've got to pay them the ransom. And then you've got people that actually develop the software. And these are like, you know, multi-million dollar software companies, the likes of like Google and stuff. So if you've ever used like a Google Docs or Office 365, one of those cool browser environments, you know, you've got like, you can edit your documents and whatnot. These companies have actually built like that level of application, but for managing your ransom. So you've got, you know, you download the executables and you click a little button and it goes, here's the executable you want to run on the, on the, on the computer you want to take over. And then it shows up on their, on their dashboard and they can be like, oh, I've got them. And this is the data that I've got and all sorts of stuff. And then when they've got like an entire suite for managing the actual ransom negotiations, so they can, you know, get reminded to send more emails and automatically send emails off to other people. And, oh, it's completely crazy. Like they've put millions of dollars into this. So it's like, it's not even a small industry. And then like right at the end, you've got these sort of like dark bank sort of groups. It's like these dark financiers. And they basically just handle escrow for this entire organization, which is just crazy because you're at this situation where everyone's like, well, the financial risk of us stealing someone else's stuff is now so complex that we need someone else to handle that transaction for us. And now there's a specialized group of people to do that. So you've got this insane group of people doing this. And the important thing to take away from that is that they're very, very smart and very, very determined. So what they'll very often have done is they'll have figured out how much you're willing to pay based on your company's financial stuff. They'll have figured out if you've got uh, ransomware insurance and how much that ransomware insurance is worth. And then they'll send you a ransom that's basically just the amount you'll pay. And you'll look at it and you'll go, oh, that's a really reasonable price because I'll end up paying nothing. My, ran my ransomware insurer will pay the insurance for it and we're all good. But the problem was, is that the ransomware insurers were bumping up their amounts they pay because of course it was happening more often, which means attackers knew that they could get more money, which meant that it just became worse and worse. So nowadays the insurers have pulled out. The companies are now basically going, we're not going to pay. So they're backing up their data and doing these like offsite backups and rolling backups and back up everything all the time. So the attackers now know that they're not likely to pay if they get ransomed. You know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So now they steal the data too, and they go, oh, you won't pay because you want the data back, but uh, we'll sell the data off to your competitors unless you pay the ransom. I was about to ask, yeah. how do they get around that? It just gets smarter and smarter and smarter. They just keep going and going and going and just going, how can we get money out of these guys now that we have all of this stuff? So, you know, 
So the future of cybersecurity <laughs> is just getting smarter and smarter, as you've said. No, no, not really. See, the big thing about cybersecurity at the moment is that a lot of it's done from this whole technology is the problem, right? So we just buy the thing and away we go. And what that does is that means that people buy the thing, they put it in a place, they get like a team to look at it and go, whenever that goes ping, just go and have a look at the thing and sort it out. Right? And the problem with it is, is if it goes ping, it only goes ping when a bad thing has happened, which means by the time it's gone ping, those guys have done all that reconnaissance, they know how much you're willing to pay, and they're just starting the attack. So the best you can do is catch up with them, which doesn't often happen because by that time they already know when you have office hours. And most of the ones we've seen are like, it's 10 p.m. on a Friday, everyone's home, most people that have a technical capability are already hungover. That's when they hit it, right? <laughs> They're smart like that. I've seen attacks that happen when they have a party for something, knowing full well that the IT team will probably be smashed at that point and unable to wow, respond. There you so go. They're, they're really smart. That needs um, reconnaissance, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a human problem, right? So the solution and where we think the future is probably going to head is towards dealing with it in a more human way, you know, trying to engage the actual human element you know, making sure that you have people in your security thing that is designed less about when the machine goes ping and more when, okay, we know that someone's going to try and get to our valuable stuff. How do I trick them into giving themselves away, right? In the same sort of way that, say, you know, our intelligence agencies do their sort of counterintelligence thing, because that's basically it. It's a human problem for people trying to steal stuff. Well, how do we apply that to computers, right? Do we put in fake, you know, documents? Like, here's a listing of all of our customers, except it's not. And as soon as you open it, well, now it tells me that you've opened it. You know, I know you're there. I don't have to worry about the machine going ping. I know when you're doing that reconnaissance, hey, he looked at this thing. Someone looked, no one should look at that thing. I should probably do something. So it's almost like setting traps and yes. getting yeah. being a few steps ahead, right? It's about Correct. being proactive and having a strategy to understand when someone's, you know, crawling around your network who you don't want on there. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, you know, what we see as the future of cybersecurity is that whole proactive, active strategy around you know, discovering when, when the baddies are on your network. And is that what Hyperfire is all about? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Our whole shtick is basically taking uh, the network, which is sort of the place, the space between computers, like, you know, if you think of the Indiana Jones space between spaces sort of thing. Everything your computer does these days, especially if it's talking to the internet, which basically everything is, is going over a network of some kind. In fact, the internet, the last bit of the internet, net comes from networks. It's just a massive in network of networks, if you will. So the idea being that if you can see what happens on a network, theoretically you can see anything that any bad guy does, but you also see what every good person does. So it's really hard to peel the bits apart. So we use a bunch of really, really neat stats, which came out of my research, funnily enough, from Curtin, um, to basically peel apart all of that information and find where odd and unusual stuff is and then go, all right, why is this odd and unusual? Is it because, you know, Dave down at uh, Marketing's decided to go use Facebook and he doesn't usually do that? Or is, or is it because someone's decided to pop in and start trying to scan through every single document looking for what they can encrypt? One of those things, you know, is okay and we can sort of say, yeah, that's a bit, of, that's normal. We shouldn't really have to worry about that. And the other one is someone probably needs to go and figure out who this guy is and why they're trying to, and wh where they've come in from and how to get them back out. So it's all about educating corporations as well as individuals around this being two steps ahead of the game? Yeah, it's, it's essentially that's it. It's, it's a bit tricky because, I mean, a lot of organisations these days, especially, you know, um, you know, people that are just, you know, getting to grips with having to put everything and putting some, like, you know, money into the cybersecurity stuff and figuring out, okay, I actually have to deal with this now. Um, now to, for us to turn around and say, actually, what you're doing might not be as effective as you think it is and bad guys know that's what you're doing and are planning to get around that. What you need to do is sort of think, how would they do it? And then sort of approach your defense from knowing how someone would break into my company, how would I defend it? And so, yeah, our, our products basically allow them to go, okay, here's the sort of internal intelligence of what's going on in their networks and say, you know, these are the sorts of things you want to look out for and these are the sorts of things you need to look for and give that sort of a real time sort of fashion. So it's software, you've actually preempted, or oh, sort yes. of preempted <laughs> uh, a couple of my future questions. So this has come out of your PhD, you said you did here. Yep. Um, is it software that you're yeah, yeah, um, commercializing we, and selling? We call it a virtual appliance. Uh, it's, it's basically like, it's a, it's a big set of software that just sits on like a dedicated computer almost. But that computer can be anywhere, it can be in the cloud, it can be you know, on the premises or whatever. And that basically just sits there watching the network and sort of like quietly informing people, hey, I just saw something. The best way of thinking about it is 
if it's working properly and if it's been set up properly, the bad guys don't know it's there, but it knows the bad guys are there and it knows about them before they're able to actually do anything dodge. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in terms of you know how a board or um, C-suite executives would think about this kind of thing, we talk about the, the rule of threes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a, a cyber defense strategy, you know, you need to train the humans. So we were talking about that before. So what should humans be looking for in terms of strange, unusual, potentially malicious behavior? So train your humans, uh, then sort out email. So there's some, you know, pretty good email programs out there that will, will pick up, you know, phishing uh, attempts and that kind of thing. You know, so have your, your email in place. And then you look at visibility. And visibility is, you know, really what's on your network, uh, what's on your devices, um, so we can start looking out for those, you know, bad actors on your on your network. And then in terms of visibility, we can break that down into three as well. So we've got perimeter defenses, which, you know, they're called firewalls, um, those kind of things. So they protect, you know, if you're talking about a, a castle analogy, they protect that the, they are your moat around your castle. Then you've got endpoint, which is antivirus on your uh, your user devices. So laptops, phones, that kind of thing. And then we have the network, which is everything that's not covered by a perimeter and endpoint. And that's where we, we come in. And you know, the types of devices that will protect are you know, network servers, you know, uh, machines that don't have, say, you know, Mac or, or Windows operating systems. They've got other operating systems that don't have antivirus and a whole range of other uh, you know, network type devices and that's where we sit. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, like subcategories of that is the bring your own devices problem. Um, so if you can consider right now how many phones are sitting in people's pockets all across Curtin talking to the Curtin wireless in whatever way, none of those have an endpoint security system on them, on them that, are, that Curtin's you know, IT team controls. So how can they possibly know what's going on? Well, the only way you'd know is if you had a network security system that's watching them. So that's the sort of problem because you go, ah, oh, no, I've got, I've got antivirus on every single computer. And it's like, yeah, you do. But um, do you have it on your phone? <laughs> and does every single staff member and student who's connected to your oh, network man. have it as well? And students are the worst, right? Because if you imagine, if you can imagine like a high school, right? No student that has a laptop is going to abide the IT or security team having any control over that laptop. They want to play Fortnite. And those guys are not going to let them play Fortnite. So they're going to get rid of that software as soon as they can. So you cannot trust the laptop. But they can't control the whole network, so you can sort of trust what happens on the network. So even though they're playing Fortnite, you can catch them playing Fortnite, and then you can catch them when they've accidentally been infected by some random malware. So, you know. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> the future seems scary, but, you know, with software like this and programs, it's obviously, like you said, being ahead of the game and, and kind of yeah. thinking like the cyber criminals, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the future. It's like, like, I've always thought it's all about thinking differently. Right now it's about, okay, stop thinking like, you know, the defenders of a castle and start thinking about it like, you know, the really good defenders of a castle will go, how would someone siege this castle? From an individual perspective, I mean, obviously you don't have a castle. You might, you might be one of those really cool people with like a whole network in their house or something. But um, most of the time it's kind of like thinking about it way, way back, not even that way, way back really, but quite a while back, um, you know, people didn't used to lock their homes, right? Because you could trust everyone in your neighborhood. Right? And that was like the really early internet. You could just do whatever and no one cared. But now we all lock our homes and it would make perfect sense to do so. And you kind of think everyone who doesn't is a bit weird. And that's sort of the shift that has to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of cultural, almost generational shift in how we approach the internet. And, you know, we kind of have to recognize that it's something we have to do before we can actually do it. But, you know, if, if we start in the workplace with the whole, let's think like the attacker and think differently, and then slowly bring that back to, okay, well, how can you help by, you know, thinking about how you'd keep your own stuff safe, then, then we can get everyone on board and then we'll all be good. Because, you know, if, you, if you've solved the human aspect to it, then it's much, much harder for the attackers to get in. Shifting focus slightly, uh, since the advent of the global pandemic, which we all love talking about, <laughs> there's also been a surge in COVID-19 related cyber attacks. So what other threats are we likely to see in the near future? Like we did when COVID-19 took over our lives. It oh, still boy. appears to sort of be. Oh, look, I don't think we're going to stop seeing any COVID-19 based attacks for quite some time because, you know, as the COVID-19 situation changes, uh, attackers just take advantage of it. Like the they're extremely opportunistic, right? So, you know, as soon as we open borders and there are cases again, 
you can guarantee that there's going to be some guy who's going to be like, I know, I'll start messaging people and saying, hey, you've been tested positive or you've been around someone who's tested positive, click this link to see more. Like, that's a lot of fear, right? You're going to see that and go, geez, oh my God, I need to click this link. But you have to be really, really careful about where that link's taking you. You got to look at it and you got to go, is this actually taking me to anything important? And you probably want to avoid them entirely because someone's probably going to call you anyway. The point is, is that someone's going to come up with that idea. And then any time, like from now until forever, any time something major happens, someone's going to go, hey, I can convince someone to click on a link by scaring them with this. So you just got to be aware. If there's anything big and scary going around and someone rocks up and says, I'm the big and scary thing and I'm coming for you, think twice about it. I think, I think the other thing that we're seeing as well from a cyber defense perspective is you know, a lot more people working from home, obviously during COVID oh, and during lockdowns. Um, next question. But Sorry, <laughs> stealing, <laughs> stealing your thunder. No, I love it. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, what, what the, I don't know, the economists, I suppose, are telling us is that uh, more people are wanting to work from home even post-lockdown because you know, everyone at workplaces and individuals have realised that they can do their job without being in the office. Uh, five days a week, and this is, you know, this is an opportunity for the the cyber attackers because, you know, this is another sort of vulnerability, you know, where they can come into a network, as you know, Stefan was talking about before. And it's so. it's, a, it's the perfect vulnerability, isn't it? Right? Because like, how as an organisation do you reach into every single one of your employees' homes and go, that's secure now? Mm-hmm. I mean, you've just got like that random, you know, router from iInit or something, like, you know. I mean, sorry, I'm coming at this from a very <laughs> That that's fine. That's where that's where I come from okay. as well. So you don't have to be technical to understand this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. for example, if you're using a VPN to access your work data or mm-hmm. your work network from home, yeah, should that not be secure enough, or is it because you're connected oh. to your home Wi-Fi that that's example. the vulnerability? This is, this is an excellent example. Um, we've we've seen this in the wild. Um, so generally speaking, if you've connected to the VPN, business trusts you. I mean, you had to have had the password to do that, right? But if someone controls your laptop. Well, now they can just kind of walk on down that little VPN tunnel and uh, suddenly, oh, I am this trusted person that definitely got in here legitimately because they had to have used the password. Because your home Wi-Fi is Correct. vulnerable and not as up to yeah. scratch as so they your just organization. Come, yeah, they just come in and they pretend to be you. And as far as your workplace is concerned, your computer is you. Oh, yep. Lord. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you're on your work network trying to hack into the finance databases. And they're like, oh, why is uh, that happening? <laughs> <laughs> so then that person can potentially, I mean, obviously investigations would go on and you'd yeah. be found to be yeah, you'd, innocent. But yeah, well, they, well, if they found it at all yeah. before an attack happened. That's very true. Um, I mean, generally speaking, you know, the worst bits are is if they've done a really, really good job of stalking you on Facebook and LinkedIn and they know that you are precisely the person with access to the stuff they want to steal. Because then no one's going to know until it's too late. Yeah. So, wow. yeah, that's the real scary thing for the for the security teams when we talk about working from home, and especially even the IT teams getting it to work. Even is that you know these places where people are now working from and have access to this like large amount of trusted information where they're trusted because well they're the person that's supposed to have access to it. That place they're working from is not safe. So. Okay, how do you make that safe? It's really hard, right? Well, that was going to be my next question. You know, we talk about so many devices in our homes being connected to the internet. I am just did a quick mental check yeah. on how many we've got at our home. There's two adults and I think we've got seven devices connected to the internet, <laughs> which seems crazy, right? But anyway, I'm sure you probably be able to beat me with the two of you. But, you know, what are some simple things we can do to protect ourselves at home from cyber attacks and therefore avoid, yeah, avoid these situation. issues yeah, when yeah. you're working from home and you're making mm. your you know your VPN becomes vulnerable because of your network. Oh yes. Um, so first things first, the, the two the two big ones, stop reusing passwords. <laughs> you know, again the whole key thing, you know, you don't use the same set of keys for every single door you have. You know, you got you got separate ones. Um, and for this very same reason, you want to use different passwords, but that's hard because now you have to remember all these passwords. Well, thankfully, a whole bunch of people have decided that that's a terrible situation to deal with. And so now there's a whole bunch of password manager software you can use. And so you just download that and you just, you don't like, again, I've seen, I've taken people through this process. It's a big deal to go, all of your passwords now need to be changed to these passwords that are on this thing. You don't do it as a one big thing. You bring it down. And as you get to going to 
places where you have to put in a password, you put the password in the thing and then you change it. Right? You change it to something that's a bit more difficult to guess. But you want to use password managers and you want to have different passwords for as many things as possible. But will they not be vulnerable at some point in time? That's how <laughs> I sort of think in a way. I mean, I don't know if I'm being doomsday here, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's sort of the thing, right? It's like if you if you want to live completely untrusting of everything, you can. But the problem is, is that that requires so much uh, personal capability. Like you're going to have to be like a crazy computer nerd in order to pull that off. And if, if you are a crazy computer nerd and you're doing this, great. But most people aren't going to be able to, which is why we go with the you know password managers. And generally, these the, the really reputable ones, like you know the last pass of the one passwords or the you know Bitwardens of the world, they're actually run by really well established cybersecurity companies who have basically really sorted out their network and they're constantly doing the right sort of thing. And they're more likely to be secure than your network is. So <laughs> your home network probably not so great, but their password managing cloud very good. So generally speaking, that's pretty good in terms of a bet. I mean, if you get hit, if that, 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 that company gets hit, you are not going to be the only person having a bad day. Everyone who subscribes to them is, and you're probably not going to be the first target. So there's going to be a bit of time. Um, however, moving away from like potential, you know, doomsday stuff with, uh, with password managers, the other one, very, very important, multi-factor authentication. You know, those weird things where they go, you know, you log in and then you have to click on a button on your phone to say, or type in a code from your phone. That is unbelievably good at stopping attackers, even if they figure out what your password is. And the reason for that is, is that they have to kind of have your phone because that's actually bound to your phone. It, your phone actually generates the code and the server generates the code. And they're the only two things that know it. So they have to have your phone to log in. And if they have your phone and they've managed to get past the face ID or the thumbprint or whatever, well, they're doing pretty good because they've got to have your thumb or your face or you. You're not in a great <laughs> position then if they've got all that, right? Yeah, exactly, right? And it's a much different situation than just someone trying to log into your stuff. So generally speaking, if you have those two things, you've done a lot of stuff to get really, really far in terms of securing, you know, just your own stuff. And then on top of that, it's really just keeping up to date with what kind of scams are going around, right? And a lot of news organizations will constantly be pushing them out, but it's not a scary sort of thing. It's not like a, it's like kind of like the whole COVID thing where they started off and saying, you know, don't be afraid, be aware. And that's the same sort of thing. You just got to be aware of those things and just know what they look like. So when you actually see them and you will, you'll go, oh, it's one of those. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, turn on automatic updates on oh, your absolutely. on your devices, okay. um, because you know because the attackers are so clever, they'll work out ways to get around your device's security, and then you know uh, Microsoft, Apple, um, you know Google, all these companies are then patching uh, those flaws and those holes um, to make the the device safe again. So yeah, make sure that you patch those. And with things like modems, a lot of them come with default you know passwords, username and passwords like admin admin. This is a favorite way for attackers to get in. So often people don't change them. So there's there's a lot of simple things that you can do um, that don't take a lot of time and, and as Stefan said, makes it really hard for attackers to get in. Well, look, thank you both for coming in and chatting with us today. If the average person like myself just wants to get a, a bit more information about how to protect their cyber world, where can they go to, to sort of find that information? Um, look, a great starting point is the Australian Cybersecurity Centre you know, which is a federal government agency that has a great website for uh, individuals, families, and also businesses. Um, so yeah, Australian Cyber Security Centre, uh, there's lots of info there, go and check it out. Wonderful, we'll pop that in the show notes so everyone can take a look. But essentially it's about trying to get a couple of steps ahead of the cyber attackers, yep. not using the same password, and just being a little bit more vigilant by the sounds of it. Yeah, and being proactive. Proactive yeah. and thinking differently. Think like them. <laughs> you've been listening to The Future of a Podcast powered by Curtin University. If you've got something out of this episode, please remember to share it and subscribe to our podcast. Until next time, bye for now. Mm -hmm.